Hello sports fans and compulsive social media scrollers. I'm Nick Rubinovitz. Welcome back to episode two of Banter with the Boys. It's been an action-packed few sporting days since we last met. Let's take a look at the week's highlights. Firstly, Liverpool fans are heartbroken as their beloved manager, Jurgen Klopp, the man who brought glory back to the club, announced he'll be retiring. Uh, and abandoning the team at the end of the season, the Reds' emotional father figure allegedly couldn't bear to tell the players the truth, so he just told them, Daddy's just going out for milk and a pack of smokes. In tennis news, despite Yannick Sinner's surname, he's been a very good boy at the Australian Open, beating Russian Daniil Medvedev to claim his first Grand Slam. Run-up Medvedev set a record for the most time spent on court in an ATP Open with 24 hours and 17 minutes. The overall record is still held by a South African. No one has spent more time in court without a victory than advocate Dali Mpofu. In cricket news on Sunday morning, the West Indies extended the life expectancy of Test cricket by beating the Aussies in Australia for the first time since 1997. West Indian captain Craig Brathwaite dedicated the victory to Australian Rodney Hogg, who called the Windies hopeless and pathetic. No one outside of Australia is exactly sure who Rodney Hogg is, but everyone pretty much agrees it sounds like David Warner. And finally, Bafana Bafana have made it into the AFCON round of 16, set to take on tournament favourites Morocco this week. Many have written them off, but we all know you can never write a South African team off, especially when they're playing away, because the longer they stay in the tournament, the more load shedding they get to avoid. As a nation, Bafana, we just want you to know we are so proud of you. And what's important is that you just have fun and we love you. No matter what happens. We're back at the historic Forester's Arms here in uh, Newlands, Cape Town with my illustrious co-host to my left. It's a cricket's very own million dollar man, legendary bowling all-rounder and paragon of fitness. Uh, looks like he's styling one of Dale Stane's skateboarding shirts. It's Chris Moneybags Morris. <laughs> Woo! And to my right... One of the Cape Wineland's greatest exports. No, it's not the 2021 Paul Heights Shiraz. It's Sean de Villiers. Yes. <laughs> Morning. Thank you, Nick. Uh, and as always, we're joined by a sporting great, uh, a legend of the game, arguably the most inelegant, least graceful, and most effective opening batsman to have played for his country. Also the most capped, most successful Test cricket captain in the history of the game. Put your hands Yo. together for the SA20 commissioner, the Buffalo Goat of Test skippers, the Buffalo Bock. Graham Smith. Oh, the commissioner. Hello, guys. Commish. I haven't been nervous for an interview for a while, but I'm nervous for that. <laughs> no, you should be. Why are you nervous, Commish? <laughs> oh, this is. Uh, I don't feel like my wit can match the three of you. Eh? No, you can't. You'll be Mr. Right. Mr. Kamish, it's a, it's a great honor for us to have you here today. Kamish, what a, what, an, what, a, what a privilege. Have you been happy with the, with the SA20? Yeah, it's actually been amazing. I mean, um, so much work went in and then first game was rained out. So it was a it was a tough start. But then from there, it's, you know, I think the cricket has been incredible. I think there's been some great team performances, but some outstanding individual performances. We saw Klaassen last night again. But uh, crowds, uh, just the way people are flocking into stadiums and the feedback of how much fun they're having uh, and loving the tournament has been, I guess, always the best part for us. It's great to see domestic players shining. But as a result, we've sent our fifth team to New Zealand. How do you feel? Yeah. And do you think Jacques Carlos is upset he wasn't picked? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm amazed he's still playing. I mean, geez, I, I sent him the other day. What are you doing? But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 frustrating. Uh, it's not an easy topic for me to talk about, but uh, uh, knowing that's why of, we're creating a safe yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so like, safe uh, space. Knowing, to knowing, to knowing, talk about it. Knowing a bit of the behind the scenes, it's <laughs> it's obviously frustrating. Um, you know, for four weeks every year, it's say twenties window is protected. You know, we have to have the best players available. Um, you know, scheduling is something that we we, we have to get right because we can't have this happening again. Just from a cost point of view, don't you think it would have been more effective to pick South Africans that have already emigrated to New Zealand and then flights <laughs> accommodation sorted? It would save jet lag as well, though. <laughs> as, a, as a huge Liverpool fan, just to take it away from cricket for a moment, yeah. were you as gutted when you heard the Klopp... Were you as gutted as when, when Klopp retirement was announced as when Ray Jennings announced his retirement? <laughs> Or less. And has, he, has Ray announced More. his retirement? At the time. Uh, <laughs> that would be a good day, actually. Um, 
Yeah, I, I actually didn't believe it because I was running around. I think I was in some airports and uh, someone posted it on one of the WhatsApp groups. So I thought someone was pulling the piss out of me. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, he's been incredible at the club. Uh, like to have someone like that, not only has provided so much success, but he's just his energy, you know, it's it's hard to replace a person like that. So it's going to be very, very difficult to, to see how Liverpool uh, replace Jurgen Klopp and, and get the best out of uh, what he's created there. We were just discussing this uh, off camera. Uh, what's happened with the Windies in, in Australia. Shamar shows this incredible performance on the weekend. Uh, bowling with what was suspected as a fractured toe, actually retired hurt the night before, in tears, walked off the field, comes back 7 for 68 with it, the Test match. It was, it's so good. I mean, you know, you asked a question about Test cricket. I mean, Love Test cricket, but it's 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 never going to be a 10, 20, 30, 40 nation format. It's it's, it's got to be a six. It's only going to be a six or seven. Yeah. And the West Indies are already you know on the fringes of whether it's going to work for them going forward. And to see a youngster come through like that and that, that young team go and win for the first time in over twenty years in Australia and that performance is so unbelievable for the format and, and to keep the West Indies you know engaged, their fans engaged. Um, it was brilliant to watch. I actually watched the last bit, uh, sat in front of the TV and watched it. It was amazing. I mean, the, it just, just to watch it unfold, there was two great games of Test cricket happening yesterday, uh, and it's brilliant. Uh, and those are the stories that will keep the game strong. But, you know, outside England, South Africa, I mean, England, India, and, and Australia, it, it's, it's a tough format to, to, to keep strong um, from commercials uh, and... It's, it's those stories now that it will hopefully, you know, change the system. And I, I quite liked his story, El Shamar Joseph. I mean, I read up, on, like, everyone's going on about his story. And the one that sticks out to me is that he was a security guard a couple of years ago. And, I, you know, I can relate to that. <laughs> I was once a bouncer at Drop Zone in Pretoria. And for me to go from my bouncing days to go play professional cricket, it's a quite a, it's, it's quite a journey. It's inspirational. So, yeah. yeah. Also, I mean, People if Rick, Rick are, comes to town, he needs yeah. anyone... Personal. I've heard during the week people like compare your story with Sia Khaleesi's story as well, like <laughs> you know where you came from and stuff. Similar, it's like looking in a mirror, basically. I mean, so what's bold. interesting, Chris, is uh, if you look at his batting performance. Shamar <laughs> <laughs> uh, so actually, yeah, the, the, the first test in Australia, batting number eleven got thirty-six, and uh, given his past work experience as a security guard. Would you pick him as a night watchman? This <laughs> <laughs> has been changed to a night hawk now. You can go and play with freedom. <laughs> Do any of uh, any of your other teammates' stories compare in terms of this uh, rags to riches kind of story? Oh, I, I think you know, like uh, I, you think of someone like Makaya, you know, and and Tim growing up where he did in the Eastern Cape, and you know, when you just, just sit and chat to the guys who played under 19 with him you know uh, that, like and what they taught him he came from a village and I wasn't there but you know the guys like um, Neil Mack and those who played under 19 with him and, and then to see how he grew into you know top international talent it, there's a lot there's a lot of stories that, that guys have and where they come from but uh, he's probably the one that, that stood out for me in, in my career let's, uh, let's move over to tennis for a second Did you guys watch the Aussie Open Finals uh, I didn't know there was any other sport on <laughs> the commish. I'm getting ahead of himself. Commish. The sinner. Uh, coming back from two sets down. The sinner. Two. Uh, uh, sinner. Jacob Sinner. I Yannick. thought uh, Yannick Sinner. Yannick. Sorry. I thought he was a German dominator. So I didn't Jacob. Play. Jacob was also. Jacob the dominator. And who, who won the women's? The grunter. Sebelinka. <laughs> ah, ah. Jude Law actually came to watch it. It really threw her off in the quarters. He wanted to make an eighth Belarusian <laughs> tennis player. <laughs> um, is it the beginning of the end for Djokovic? No. No. No, Novak's gone. Novak can do what he wants. He's close oh. to being the greatest of all time. Do you think he could... Did you see the footage of him playing cricket facing up to... It was horrible. Steve Smith. Smith. Fresh. Smashing him into the... Didn't he need a freshie first, though? He did. Yeah, he edged one. And then he smashed him into the... There is a Serbian cricket team, is there? No, but he hit him with his tennis it. racket. No, yeah, it's bat as well. He used a bat as well. Bat as well. I mean, he missed it with a bat. Yeah. 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 And then he hit him into the crowd with a tennis racket. Yeah. That's On the correct. point. And then said, yeah. don't bowl there. There's, there's, don't there's, you watch TV, yeah. Steve? Um, a Serbian cricket team. I don't know. That's an Icelandic no, cricket team. No, it is. There's a Serbian. Very abusive on Twitter. It's quite yeah. 
They celebrated Andrew Clausen's retirement from Test cricket. Congratulations on your mighty four Test career. Icelandic cricket. It is. Very good. You know, they have an app in Iceland. If you go to a bar and meet somebody, there's an app that you can quickly work out if you're related to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's time now for the the long I'm tail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the long tail, we are going to delve more deeply. We're going to do a deep dive into Graham. Oh. That might have come out wrong. <laughs> but just before we do dive, let's Take catch up with the next installment of Fans in the Stands. How's it, guys? Welcome back to episode two of Fans in the Stands. We're going to go cause some chaos. Let's go find some people. You walk into a bar, see two beautiful go girls. One's blonde, one's brunette. Which one are you going for? Brunette. Always. Brunette. Always, always. Brunette. Brunette. Down. We are back in the Fans in the Stands. But we have found a bride to be. <laughs> so, what was your first date like with hubby? Uh, well, our first date was in Barcelona, so it was pretty good. You from England? Yeah, he's from South Africa. I'm from England. Yeah. So who's hubby? Who's hubby? Oh, there's a sweet couple. <laughs> Okie dokie. So, Barcelona. It was a good first date. Yeah. But if you were in South Africa cooking her South African food, what are you cooking? Oh my. God. God, there's a mixture of things, but it's definitely going to be uh, lamb shank, 100%. That's a good option. 100%, my lamb shank's the best, I would say. I agree with that. What do you think about lamb shank? Oh, I do love his lamb shank. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just keep it PG. Thank you. Let's keep it PG. If you were going to place a bet today, yeah. who's winning? Am I or Joburg? Definitely am I. Definitely. That's a strong, that's a strong... Oh, we have to. It's a must win. Fair enough. But now more of a more fun question. First date. Yeah. What food are you eating if you bring a girl home for a first date? What are you cooking up for her? <laughs> it's a bit tricky. Uh, most likely, get some pizza. I think it's going to be easier since instead of me standing around and needing to cook the whole meal. Just order your meal. It's just easy. But cooking brings an atmosphere. You can't order pizza. That's like that's the wrong attitude for a first date. You got to show. Yeah, you got to show. Got to show impact. <laughs> Okay, if I was to do that, I think maybe make a nice pasta, you know, serve some wine. So pasta and wine, why not? It's White or red wine? White. Good choice. <laughs> Enjoy your first date with pasta. Thank you. <laughs> you got three in your first innings in test cricket. I got three less than that. But what was memorable was we had to down a beer out of Merv Hughes's shoe. There was a hole the shoey. in the toe. And that's the UCT. Uh, there was a UCT, not the real Merv Hughes, but it was a different guy. <laughs> Looked nothing like Merv Hughes. But you got sledged non-stop, if I remember correctly, during that game by a few different individuals. Did you open the batting? I've got it at three. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a great Australian team, uh, and they had so many experienced power guys. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that played the game like that. I, I actually... I, th I remember doing an interview afterwards and I just spoke candidly around the experience, not even thinking about it, but it got turned into like a sledging kind of big story. Um, and our mates with like Matty Hayden and obviously, you know, Warney uh, has passed now and so on and many Australian cricketers at the time, it was a proper welcome to test cricket. I'll, I'll never forget second innings walking out. You know, Matty Hayden met me halfway and then Warney was bowling. You had Langer. Short leg, Steve Ward slipped, Mark Wall, uh, you know, and it was just other boys let me know about uh, the way of the world. Well, firstly, we'll get back to the advice. I think it was Boucher gave you how to get back at McGrath. Well, I don't know if that's repeatable, but Brett Lee, we can repeat. Brett Lee was very simple in the Chris Morris start of sledging. He just, I think maybe he had a pitch collision or something like that. And he just said, oh, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to, I'm going to kill him. Well, he, he he did bowl fast enough to uh, yeah. to, to, to be able to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember that attack. I mean, Brett Lee, McGraw, Gillespie uh, in his prime, and and Shane Warne. This is like a hell of a sort of attack to make your debut against. And I think the thing for me was actually when you when I performed as a youngster there, you, you almost got so excited that that was the toughest, and you yeah. did well. And I, the kind of exuberance of use, you share these as experiences. But it was a, it was an interesting lesson in in media. <laughs> Well, what, so what is with fast bowlers? Like this guy, 
Uh, medium pay. I was never fast enough to talk to the kill them. I thought. Well, it, you did, though. Yeah, I told them, but yeah. it never worked. But it's the death threat. Let's just talk about the death threat as your initial first sledge. Like, where do you? How do you escalate from? I'm going to kill you. What is your <laughs> second sledge? I'm going to kill you, then resuscitate you, and then kill you again. Like, where would you go? Actually, more Shanta Langa said something that was incredible once. He said that he wanted to hit a batsman so hard in the body that he would collapse. And then when he's collapsed from a broken rib, he wants to take his rib and stab him with it. Jeepers. But this is a guy who's... Oh, you got some head of a story. This is a man. guy that... You, this is a guy that dug his own... <laughs> but this is a guy in pre-season, instead of doing pre-season training, he dug his own pool at his house. Okay. So we're talking with a very off recurrence man who bowled the speed a lot to you. But... Uh, actually, we... In 2012, um, when uh, the Kevin Peterson tech skates unfolded, uh, when we were touring England, the last test we played at Lords, uh, we wanted to go number one in the world, but it had been a very tense test match. And Andrew Strauss, who generally was quite a quiet guy on the field, had uh, found his mouth in, in that game and uh, was giving, uh, I think every batter that came back into the change room said, I can't wait to get hold of him on the yeah. field. Um, and uh, Vernon <laughs> uh, ran up, beat him twice, and said to him today, I'm going to end your career. The next ball he padded up, given out LBW, and he retired after that test finish. <laughs> you were complicit in the the retirement of three English captains. Who was your favourite? Who, who, which one delighted you the most? He's so Vaughan. <laughs> no, actually, Vaughan for me was uh, the one that I was probably... Because uh, I kind of started young. NASA, he tried to take me on and... You know, we we had played really well the first two tests, and he he resigned after the first one that I. Didn't played. someone say your name wrong? Someone yeah, called NASA. NASA could NASA Greg. introduced me to the mascot as Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I was so nervous at the time, first didn't test match, being 20, 22 years old. I was just like, couldn't give you my word. What was the? Didn't you call you what's his name? No, nah, he was calling me what's his name in the press and stuff. Uh, <laughs> but um, he introduced me as Greg, and you know, um, so. When he resigned, I, I guess at the time I was a bit, uh, I mean, I was so young, 22, yeah. there was so much happening around. I got a double hundred in the game um, and the game was a draw. So it wasn't because we beat them in that game, but obviously for him, he had reached the end. But Vaughny kind of started at the same time as me. So we had a lot of years playing against each other. We became good mates. Um, you know, he was a really, probably England's most creative captain at the time. You know, that he really changed. He was probably the first stepping stone to our England started to play differently and think differently. Um, and then, I don't know, I mean, it's different now, but I, I never really got on that well with Andrew Strauss. I mean, he was a proper kind of head boy and I was more a guy that liked to get in the trenches, you know. Uh, so when he retired, and also it was quite a tense, tense moment. But you always have respect for these guys, you know. Yeah. You're very young, you get the captaincy <coughs> early, you, you've got these senior players, you're captaining your country, you going through puberty at the same time. <laughs> How? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is the pressure. I mean, your dad's, I came across this thing your dad said where he said, I'm worried Graham will lose the best years of his life. Did he say something like that? My dad actually didn't want me to take the captaincy when I was 21, 22. He tried to talk me out of it. But, uh, you know, for me, it, would be, it was like a, a goal. And, you know, you never know if it's going to come around again. And, you know, I, I kind of believed that I could... I mean, I didn't quite understand the enormity of, of the job at the time being, you know, and the challenges that came with it, on, like especially off the field. And, you know, um, you know, you think about just captaining on the field. And that's all I thought about. And, and actually what was unbelievable was the support I got from the senior players at the time. It was almost like they they were kind of ready for the change and wanted to be a part of it, you know. Um, but off the field was tough, um, you know, learning the hard way. So there were often times where, you know, in those early years, people of, often think I'm arrogant, but more it was like a protective mechanism. Yeah. So wherever you go in the world, you're getting challenged. So you, you kind of develop this like mindset of, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you on. You know, it's like, it, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not, there's no longevity in it, but in the early years is what kind of protected me, you know, it was, was that, type of determination and mindset to kind of show you 
Um, and then, like, as you gain experience, you learn to manage, I guess, things better. Because the, the, the playing part is the easy part. That's what you do. Yeah. That, that's what you've been doing all your life. That's why you became a, a, a pro tier player, yeah. um, made captain. But it's the off the field stuff that, that really drains you and stuff that you might not be that yeah. accustomed to. And, 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 and as much to as do. you try and stay away from it, there's always uh, one, one of your mates and family to... members that will send you an article yeah. that's been written about your, this like said that. So you generally hear about everything. So, you know, I, I think that's what separates guys who play at international level and guys who don't generally. There's a lot of talent in sports when you yeah. probably never make, but it's that pressure. It's learning to cope with that, that experience, that pressure, um, uh, that, that helps you stay there. And, and, and a big part of it is learning to deal with failure as well. Like, yeah. you know, as a batter, you fail more than you succeed. I mean, like, Sashin, if you take his record, he scored one in three, one in four, you know? So you learning to deal with that is a big part of kind of handling yourself. But I think for every, I can, I can still remember, um, we both had knee injuries. Can you remember? And we did, um, we did a bit of rehab together. And we were like 19 years old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had a couple after that as well, <laughs> but um, but then I, I made my Springbok debut at the age of 21. He makes his debut at the age of 21 from the protest. Then he goes captain, and I'm like, I'm still a lighty. You know, this oak is now captain of South Africa, having to take on all of that. And I think that I think that's been the lesson throughout, certainly throughout your career, the way that you that you approach that, and and you can you can. You can understand from a father point of view, he wanted to protect you because mm. he, he knows what it's like being a 22-year-old. And now all of this is thrown onto you, but the way that you got through it was... You know, that's why you're the commish. Yeah, and as a, as, years of trading. Yeah. As a captain, I've got to go, so what were you more proud of? Were you more proud of that first win in Australia? More proud of doing it again in Australia or becoming world number one? Because obviously all of that did lead to becoming world number one, but which moment did you feel was a bigger moment becoming test team number one or that first win in Australia that we'd never done before? Look, I think for me, it was a period. So it was like, it was also building that team, mm. you know, uh, it, it, it like culminated in maybe my own personal growth as well. So like there was that period after I said, yeah, I had to like, okay, I'd been captain, I was 26, I'd been captain for four years. I needed to actually, you know, make a more, so figuring myself out to that stage. And then, you know, the likes of, you know, Dale Stain starts to come in, Mornay Morkel, Hashim Amla, you know, AB. You start building that, that team environment. I think from there, we, I don't think we, we lost um, away from home for like six, seven years in that period. Yeah. Um, and you know, we went to England and we won in England. That was massive in 08 for us. And that was kind of, okay, we broken down that barrier and then it was Australia. And uh, I think that tour to Australia was more just how those games ebbed and flowed. Um, and having been obliterated in Australia before, and I was a part of one tour, it was just like, so I remember sitting in the team bus after Melbourne and seeing Callis in the field, you know, because he had been on so many tours to Australia. It's always so tough, the crowds, the media, and, and now we'd broken that like barrier down. And so, you know, the, the, all, those moments were, were massive. We had a hell of a celebration in that MCG change room. Um, we tried to go out, dancers had to mock, walk about around the casino for about two hours. <laughs> but it was a moment we'll never forget. But which one was the mo which one to you? Was it I, I think the first, first moments are, are massive. I think to go back then up, like because Springboks have done now with this back to back World Cup, it's flipping hard. Eh? Yeah. But they they always different moments. So like it's four years later. Yeah. So to have kept that team together, yeah. performing at that level. Four years later, is also, um, but they all like winning those two series in England and Australia were like the highlights of my career. Cool. Uh, disappointed, never got a World Cup. We should have won T20 World Cup in 09 in England. We lost to Pakistan in the semi final. That was the one that, like, for me, I really believe we were the best team by our country mile. Um, we should have won that one, but uh, hopefully it's around the corner. And an IPL winner. Yeah. First year. With the, the Royals. Royals. With the Royals. With the Royals, guys. I just done. They're still playing in blues. Yeah. No, I'm just saying it's with the Royals. <laughs> Who knows what's happening the in the SA 2024. Outside that first experience of IPL, it was like mesmerizing. I remember the final trying to get out of our team hotels. Like, bus couldn't even get out of the hotel. Chaos. But Warney was our captain, and I'll never forget his team talks. Warney, he liked to smoke. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of young. 
young guys in the team and he would always have his smoke in his hand when he was giving his team talk. <laughs> you could just see the smoke coming out the back. Uh, but I mean, that was like the wonderful, that was our first experience of playing in a tournament also where you were exposed to all these other nations and you got, so you started playing against them and there was like this tension all the time. You suddenly got to spend quality time with them and that was just, it was like broke down barriers like you can't believe. We're going to be back in a moment with more great stories from sporting greats, Graham Smith, but in the interim, let's, let's have some more fans in the stands. Right guys, we find some beautiful men in a 2-2, it never goes wrong with that. Firstly, who are we supporting today? MI Cape Town. Uh, Joe Berg. Oh, a bit of a toss up going on, yeah? Right, a bit of a fun question. You walk into a bar, there's a blonde and a brunette best friend. Who's taking which one? <laughs> I couldn't say. I found these two beautiful ladies here at the cricket. Guys, what do you think about a first date at the cricket? First date at the cricket. I think that depends on the context, but especially if you don't know anything about cricket, it could be pretty romantic, I think. Romantic. Yes. Cricket romantic. Yeah. Pre pretend to be dumb and then the person explains everything and that's how you know you begin the man. That's definitely one way to look at it. <laughs> but now we're in Cape Town, it's a beautiful country. Or what is city? Would you want to go to the Winelands for a first date? Yes. I think I would prefer the cricket. Jesus, that's I an unpopular I answer. I think you want to go to the Winelands when you know the person, when you've broken the ice. But actually cricket is just more fun. Good. We're actually supposed to come with three boys and they've all ditched on us. So we're going as a date between us two. Oh, nothing wrong with a girl's date. Girl's date. Yeah, we're just hoping that the ball comes to our direction. That's the most important thing. Two million round catch. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Are you catching or is he catching? He's, he's catching. He's catching. I back you. Good luck with your catching. Sure, thanks. thanks for the interview. Enjoy date night. <laughs> that was episode two of Fans of the Stands. Thank you guys so much for watching. I think Joe Big Super King is going to win. Make sure you guys get your best on him back way. Cheers. Welcome back. The, the, the late, great Shane Warne. You start off your career. He... he, he Calls you the C word actually for a prolonged period of time. <laughs> Crocodile. In your first test. Crocodile? Yeah. <laughs> you then end up playing IPL cricket with him and discover the human being behind. Tell us a bit about that process. Yeah, I mean, Wardy was a competitor on the field. Like the skill levels that he had were just incredible, but also the gamesmanship. He was just one of those guys that almost thrived in those gamesmanship moments, you know. And he got the best out of him. Like some guys can chirp, and in the like they feel affected by it, or it impacts them, and it, it puts too much pressure on them. But he almost lived for that type of uh, stuff. So in my first tour as captain, I think it was oh five. Uh, Iwani was going after a lot of the batters. So I stupidly thought, let me uh, let me have a go at him, and uh, try and take a bit of pressure off the other guys, but. One thing I did learn is that for the next two months that he's quite a relentless man. <laughs> <laughs> he wore me down. But um, we, in the end, we became like great mates playing with him at the IPL. Um, I'll never forget when, when I got selected and he was captain, you know, we got a call from guys inside the Royals to make sure that we were, <laughs> we were going to get on. And, uh, and yeah, I ended up having some of my best times with Warney, you know. It was a sad day when we lost him, but uh, it was just such a great character off the field and the guy to spend time with and just chat about life. And he was one of those guys, he was quite infectious in, in how he made you feel, you know. Once you got close with him, you really felt like Warney was as, lo as loyal a person as you could get. Talking yeah. of um, <laughs> adversity, of course, the iconic broken hand moment. It's the third and final test, 09, in Australia. Yeah. You've won the series, 2-0 up, final test in Sydney. You think you will play no further part in the game. You've been hit on the hand. You go off for x-rays and blood platelets and whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, run us through. So that tour, I, I, I developed terrible tennis elbow. Um, and I was going to require surgery at some point. So Long trip. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually we went straight from England. Yeah, so yeah, I had been a long tour. But uh, so I was having cortisone injections in my elbow for that. So it's so before every game I'd have one and then play the game. So when I broke my hand, they 
the team doctor flew me to Australia to try and have this platelet injection in my elbow to try and help healing. So where did you break the hand? Was it? So it was in Sydney. Yeah. Then I was like, so I actually missed. I was on a. I was in Melbourne for like day three of that test because the doctor sort broken hand out the game. That flew me to Melbourne. I had this injection in my elbow. Came back. I wasn't gonna. Obviously, I needed time out. It broken right through my knuckle. Yeah. So I wasn't gonna play. Um, I was flying home at the end of the test and I didn't even actually take whites to the ground on, on that day's play. I went just in my warm-up gear. I was going to go to the airport later that evening and fly back. And it'd been like a hell of a tour because the first time we had won, we'd just won in Melbourne. Um, and so you, were there, you were there to lift the trophy? I was there to c celebrate with the boy and then I was going to fly home. Single uh, <laughs> Listen, winning in Australia for the first no, time absolutely. was like, for us, we were going to make the most of that. Um, and I just kind of watched the day unfold and, you know, the guys were fighting it out. After, you know, we were in a terrible position and then, you know, like Makaya and Dale ended up batting for like a, a long period of time. And then, so then the thought starts, you're sitting there and you're watching and you think, there's a chance. But what I do now, you know. Who's, whose thought was it? Was it you or did it was me? So I went inside. Uh, so I, there was... Mickey Arthur, Jeremy Snape, and who was the psychologist and in the physio. So M Mickey was 100% you've got to do it when I lost it. And then uh, the physio was like, no. And then the psychologist gave me the best of both, both worlds, you know. <laughs> so eventually I was like, okay, I'm all in. Took the cast off, went into the, I thought the only person that probably fit me clothes wise, Callus. So I went digging in his, uh, <coughs> in his bag, um, took Paul Harris's test. Uh, jersey he'd obviously had a good lunch there was a nice stain on it <laughs> and then uh, Neil Mack helped me pad up you know? so he got, got me padded up boxing pads on helmet on he would have been quite box. delicate with the oh, box he, he, was, he was very delicate really yeah, yeah. Um, and then so at the SCG it's quite an old change room it hasn't it hasn't been redone so it's quite a small change room in the back in the physio room there was a change room attendant that <coughs> sorry used to be called The Rock and he always used to write motivational quotes on in the this back section of, uh, of of the change room. So I thought, let me go there and just try and think about now. I'm, I've committed. Fine I'm prepared. <laughs> I need to think about how I'm, I'm going to go out and face Johnson. I'm going to handle the short ball. So all these things are going through my head. I walk in there, and uh, Callis is sitting there. <laughs> so he just starts laughing at me. <laughs> so he starts giving me that quote about chick stick scars and glory loss forever. So I thought. No, uh, time to get away from him. And then you're kind of there and you're thinking, and then the next minute, Dale gets out and now you've got to go. So walking out um, and it was the only time that I think Micaiah was my senior partner. <laughs> so we were batting together there. Uh, first over, he nicked it, dropped by eight and it slipped and then we started hanging in there. Um, my most frustrating moment that still haunts me today is that I actually got a serious bat on. I got a serious ball to get out, but I got a bat on one, and my instinct as a batter said no. I should have run. Should have run. Uh, and then I got out like two balls later. Um, so that still haunts me that I could have been on the other side. Maybe and lost it by that. We lost by eleven balls. We were eleven balls short. That ball, I reckon, would have gotten you out anyway. Yeah, I mean, it was the same crack that had jumped up and broke my hand. Serious, but, crack but had, you, had you taken the run, would you have been facing or no, would Demarai have been facing no, no, no. that ball? Senior batter. But it was just the instinct of being a batter that I yeah. wanted to protect him. And then when I realised that it was too late. Yeah. Um, You're the left uh, I often still wake up at night thinking about that moment. Paul Harris talks about when he walks out to bat. He says, that obviously, the whole of the MCG are standing. Or is the SCG, SCG, yeah. mm. SCG applauding? Uh, this is heroic. You got Graham Smith, broken hand, going out to bat. And he said there was one specific woman that was sitting close to them in the member stand. And they're like, oh, Graham, amazing, mate, amazing. Oh, good luck, mate. Good luck. And as soon as he's crossed the line, the face his first ball. He's going, oh, come on, Mitch, f***ing kill me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is Australia. That, that really is Australia. But, <clears throat> yeah, it, it was one of those moments also where you, like, you don't realise. Yeah. Like you, in adrenaline. In the magnitude, yeah. You don't know what it's like. You've been in Australia for two months. You're isolated from the world. You know, you don't actually... And then I got on a plane and came home and I landed in South Africa. And then suddenly, like, you'd, people were at the airport. Yeah. And I was like, Shit. You know, it was a, it was like a, a, a moment that I realised how, like, sport impacts yeah. people. Mm. We're going to finish off with the, the quick fire, the pro-tech quick fire round. 
best bowler you've ever faced? Listen, I can never answer that question. You play for like 14, 15 years. You start with McGraw, uh, Anderson. Canelo. Uh, you know, Canelo uh, Millet one. Yeah. Say so I can't? Yeah, he got me out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I can't walk around India without getting yeah. reminded of it. But also then Warren, Murali. Yeah, I mean, you know, also like going... McGraw. Growing up in South Africa against fast bowling and then you go and face... One of Murlutran in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, or Anil Kumble in India and Oaks are giggling at you around the bat yeah. and bouncing and spinning and it's the first time and you've got to then figure that out. Yeah. So that, like, it, I always found every series there was one guy that was in or two guys that were going to be like yeah. a challenge. But um, making your debuts against like that that bowling attack will always stand out. And Sri Lankans do laugh at you, yeah. They even laugh at you on the balls in the air. I only played ODI cricket and they had a guy called the Jantha Mendes. <coughs> Mr. Yeah. Spinner would run in and bowl yeah. and the balls in the air. Like it looks like, like a seamer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you're facing Muraliton on day four there and then yes. six <laughs> guys around the bat. And they laugh at you. Sanger and Maela are, uh, are giggling at you. Uh, it's... It's a tale of an opener. Yeah. Is it easier remembering who the worst bowler in international cricket you've ever faced is? I feel like... Uh, candidates. Uh, Can, any candidates? Worst bowler. I'm trying to think, yeah. Pat who is, who is that? Pattinson. Yeah, he came out of nowhere. Pattinson. Uh, Australia, yeah. Australian. He's quite arrogant guy. Uh, hey. No, no, no. no not, so there was another Pattinson that got no. picked for England. It's his brother. His brother, older yeah. brother, got it's picked for England. England. No, man, the, the, the Australian. Yes, his older brother got picked against England because I thought yeah. no one had seen him and Graham's going to get out to this guy and Graham spanked him. Uh, the commish took uh, care of it. Maybe and Ashville got big hundreds in that game, but we... Uh, Pattinson. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that was the tour where uh, Flintoff, had, we won in Birmingham, mm. but Flint... <laughs> Kellis was couldn't they couldn't see it out of the vault full tosses. He was bowling low full McKenzie tosses. Mackenzie had lots of ducking into <laughs> McKenzie was ducking. <laughs> and what about like a Shaib Akta? Okay, I'm back to best bowler. So Shaib for me. Or Tate or one of those he, super quicks. He, he, he was, Shaib was super quick, terrible to face in his prime. Like, um, I mean, he used to run up was long. He used to turn around and the keeper yeah. was kilometers back. And, the and you just see his hair bouncing and he's running in. <laughs> there was nothing better than just getting that single <laughs> running past your, your partner and saying, <laughs> Good luck, <legs>, son. <laughs> I'm off strike now. <laughs> oh, Go for two. No, no, no. I'll tell you. And because, I mean, when you played him in the subcontinent as well, he bowled two legs. So it was either at your toe with reverse swing or it was at your head. head. So yeah. I mean, he hit Gary in that one test mm. match. Neil Mack went out next and he said there was blood all over the floor <laughs> when he's taking guard. And he got a Yorker on the toe. So he was like, Bouse was coming in. <laughs> Sharp was on an hat trick, and Bouse was like in the change room. Is he going to bounce or all Yorker? Bounce or Yorker? <laughs> it was a length ball that he nicked up. <laughs> and that's, yeah, he used to cause chaos in the change room. Please not. Yeah, Matt always tells a story about Sharp. It's a nice quick fire, sorry. There's a quick, quick fire. Is this called this quick, quick fire, fire, fire question? We'll get to that. Dale <laughs> okay. Beggett's son goes out to bed because Zulu's gotten out now. And your Max is sitting in the change room, and Zulu's going, You're useless. You're not good enough for this game. You're not good enough. <laughs> Because obviously it's Shaib Jundin and Baldwin. Yorker, Stump's gone. Dale Pegginstown's gone out first ball. Stoker. But Zulu's abusing himself. Yeah, useless. You should never... You can't even play this game. What are you even doing yet? <laughs> and there was like... It says there was about three or four seconds of silence. And goes... Ah, too good for me. F*** that. Too, <laughs> too good for me. <laughs> best <laughs> teammate on the jaw. <laughs> There's quite a few of them, actually. Uh... Listen, there's, there's, quite, there's quite a few there's different a, groups. There's though. a consistency that we've like realized that there's one person that sticks out amongst everybody that has got the biggest tank and goes until the sun comes up the most consistently. Who's that? AB. Yeah, AB's got some stamina. We well, can get him out these days. He's got stamina. Well, it's like Sean. You know, he's one of those guys now that you can never get him, but if you do get him, then it's, it's a... It's a it's fantastic. a demolition thing. It's a demolition thing. Yeah. <laughs> He's like an elusive fuck. But after the night out, this man needs to get away. I mean, if you are like at an event somewhere and you have yeah. lots of drinks, get away. the next morning you can't find him. Did, God. Speaking of which, have you ever <laughs> punched either Kepler Vessels, Hansi Cronier or Sean Pollock in the face? I actually never met Hansi, which was an oh, no. incredible thing. I never met him. Um, Kepler... Punched you back? No, I, he was a boxer, so I kind of left him alone. Okay, right. Fair enough. <laughs> and who was the third one? Polly. Polly. No, no, no. I ended up playing with Polly for a long. Polly's okay. He's one of the not something. Yeah, he's one of the nice the guys. He's asking Nick. because I I punched John Smith. Nick, there's an interesting there's an interesting <laughs> story that I think Graham will tell you because Graham used to sell chickens, 
at a restaurant. And before the 2019... Can't 20, have your chicken and Brian. Before the uh, before the 2015 World Cup, the protest happened to go to Vasco's. And do you recall what happened to a certain captain of the team walking down your wonderful stairs is it, is at Vasco's? fell down the stairs. <laughs> Before 2015, and been fell down the stairs the night before we flew. Oh, they flew out. Sorry, <laughs> I'll never forget. How, how, how there was massive panic there he, <laughs> when he stood up and he was able to walk normally. <laughs> so everyone was like, "Bang!" Because you've had to carry a number of players in military the training. If it's what's been the one of the messiest celebrations you've ever been part of? Four three eight game. Um, Gee, we haven't talked about the four three eight. Yeah, I wanted to say what's that bottle that that went over hundred grand? Mick, 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 Mick bus driver. So four three eight game, we had a massive celebration. Uh, Mickey Arthur had to be carried out of the change room, um, and then we went back to the hotel. We actually ended up drinking with the Aussies <laughs> in the old Sands and Sutton, that old bar there, uh, and we sat there for hours. Just obviously both teams, and uh, Bouch, uh, who we know very well. Is, always reaches a limit where he, alcohol takes over, you know, and he's, he loses his function of his, uh, <laughs> of his, of his, of his, <laughs> of his voice and, and, uh, his head. Um, so I think he realized he's got to go to bed. So we watched him walk out of the bar and he got in the lift of the Santon Sun, which is glass windows. And he went to hit the button, fell over and we left him in the lift for 45 minutes going up and down <laughs> until Brett Lee decided, no guys, we can't do this to him. And he went and fetched him and took him to bed. Best opposition team you've ever played against? That great Australian team in the early years. You know, I, I, I'd never play. I, I don't think I, I ever played against a team that was as well, like had every base covered. You know, you, you literally, you know, and what I learned from there was often in a test match of f five days, four or five days, you know, you could compete with them to a certain level. They always had more mm -hmm. in the tank than you. They always had someone that, you know, performed at the right time. I mean, You'd have to fight through Hayden, Langer, Steve War, the guys, and then Gilchrist would walk in at seven. Bevan. And yeah, Bevan. Gilchrist was the come in, your bowlers are worn down, and then he would smash you to all parts, you know. So, um, and that was something, I mean, we were like a great team, you know, learning to kind of make sure that we always had more in the tank, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I learned that from them. They were unbelievable. Best captain you've played against or with? Um, lots, obviously, but uh, like, I played against Ricky Ponting a lot. Uh, he was probably the most competitive person I ever played against uh, as a leader and as a as a player. Um, so I would say I would say uh, Panna uh, for me was probably the the biggest competitor I had. One question, John. I want to yeah, ask yes, uh, this question because of the the the, the use of Afrikaans uh, on the field against international teams, as we know in rugby, we recently had a controversy at the World Cup with Bongi and Bonambi. Uh, did you ever get in hot water using Afrikaans? Did but, you ever say so things like, <laughs> Languages is not my strength. Um, so Afrikaans is not a subject that I'm very good at. So my teammates actually spend a lot of time laughing at my Afrikaans on the field. So uh, one of the, we always tried to talk Afrikaans, but like Hashim and I are batting together. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't very good. Uh, so we often, it doesn't come naturally out. We often used to say something and then end up laughing at each other. And <laughs> just very bad. Well, there you go. That's it. Over to Betty's bets. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the show. In the words of King Callis, we, we hope it leave your hair back. Hi, guys. I'm Amy Fusel, sports fanatic and a lady who loves a bet. There's been some incredible moments on and off the pitch this season. But I'm here to tell you about the sporting bets you can profit on with these tips. Are my best bets for the week. Thank you for watching Banter Boys today, and we'll tune in for the next episode. See you soon.